Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Keep the Mic On. I am Simply Sherry, and as you know, we are here most every week in conversation with an amazing artist. We apologize. We were supposed to be here last week, but there was an uh, unavoidable emergency and we could not. Um, we will reschedule the interview with Naya Williams as soon as we can. Uh, my week is called From Behind the Microphone, where we take the time to get to know the person behind the performance, because performers are people, too. Um, I'm not going to take any shine from Kaniki telling you, you know, this is the time to go tell everybody. We're here live on Facebook and on YouTube. Um, and if you are joining us from Spotify later, hey. Hey, hey. I have there are many, many episodes on, on Spotify for your listening pleasure. So, you know, with that, with that I'm going to go ahead and kick it to Girl Genius. Hey everyone, I'm Girl Genius. I am coming to you from the road. Good to see everybody this beautiful, kind of sort of, if you can see out the window, kind of rainy Sunday. Um, <laughs> anywho, my week is third week of the month and I, wait a minute, I'm lunching, not third week, first week. Lord Jesus, I was listening to you and thinking about me. My bad. I'm first week of every month. First, first. <laughs> Lord Jesus. Um, and it's called Let's Talk About the Dot, 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 Usually Book. But I like to uh, interview artists who have product and tangible things and kind of dig into the process of how we get from, you know, here's a concept to here's this thing I can now give you. Yay. Um, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to give it to, hey, I got it right this time, Miss Cayenne. Hey, hey, what's up, everybody? It's Miss Cayenne. I'm a poet and I know it. Mm -hmm. And I am the host for the second week you got me all confused too the second week of the <laughs> <laughs> look we're just here every week just come back it's a surprise everybody right, just, surprise. You know, like how I host come back next week it'll be somebody else <laughs> <laughs> right right I'll be here you be here you here so I my, my segment is called passion projects and the root behind the why so we discuss the story of a person why they have uh opted to be this artist and delve into that artistic uh that vein and i love to be able to ask all the questions i was the kid who asked but why but why so here i have an excuse to do that uh, and my little pup is letting us know that he's in the room as well so i'm excited as always about tonight um and i'm not going to take up any more time i'm going to kick it kick it kick it to the one the only kaniki jakarta <laughs> okay wait a second she's muted It's happening, it's happening. I got a new okay, computer, y'all, and I don't know how to work it. I was like, okay, it's going to be on you. That's why I was like, one minute, one minute, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. <laughs> so definitely welcome, welcome, welcome. Let me just first save this little spiel. So uh, Keep the Mic On was uh, created by us. Somebody said it was my idea, but I don't know. He, the, I don't know. It, it was somebody's idea to do something online, right? Okay. So we've been here since March 2020. Um 2020, 2020. Yes, that's been a long time. We've been it's here. Been we, we started doing the uh the pandemic, and uh everybody liked it. You said it's a master class. You had said it. It's a master class. So we actually get to talk to the artist and talk to them a little bit. Uh, you know how you when you are the feature, you don't get to ask all of the questions, right? So we give you an opportunity to ask questions. I ask the questions that you might want to ask. If I don't ask your questions, then you can ask them yourself in the chat, and then we'll read them off to the artist. Um, we volunteer our time every week. Everybody that comes on, they volunteer their time. Nobody's paid, but these platforms are not free, y'all. So if you would like us to continue to keep the mic on, at the bottom, you'll see scrolling our cash app. So if you can drop some coinage, as I like to say, in there so we can continue to mic keep the mic on, we would so appreciate it. So this week, this week, this week, my week is this week. It is called Poets and Platforms, where I interview poets who have platforms for the arts. And I'm very super duper, uber excited. If you um, if you joined me for Bus Boys and Poets, he was my feature. Um, a lot of times, you know, these artists and such don't get enough time. So I am very happy that he decided to come on as a special guest as well so I can ask him some questions and such and things. I always say by the time I read the bio of these magnificent people, um, the bio is expired. So we're going to break down the bio and ask some, some questions as well. I did not prep him for these questions because 
I did not, I don't know what I'm going to ask. So we're going to find out. You're going to find out when I found out. So our special guest tonight is Bo Money Arma. He is a hip hop artist, rapper, poet, songwriter, producer, performer, and educator born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Prince George's County, Maryland. Bo Money uses his life experiences mixed with his musical and poetry skills to paint lyrical pictures of life as he sees it and the future as he envisions it. He is best known for his 2007 viral BET video, Read a Book. He followed that up with his debut album, Radio Friendly. He is a published writer for the Washington Post and LA Time, former director of poetry events for Busboys and Poets, and hip hop artist on the Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. Um, I guess it's C-E-T-A, but it's probably a uh, set up, I don't know, program, and so, so, so much more. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce to you tonight our magnificent, magnificent, not a rapper, not a rapper, not Boy. a rapper. For money or more. Thank you so much, sir, for deciding Thank to you. join us tonight. I'm so happy to see you. I see you ready in the studio. Oh, yeah. Ready. Yeah, this is, I, I, I live here, like, quite literally. Clear, clear, clear. <laughs> I see pictures and things and such. Yeah. So yeah, we, we're gonna get into our interview part, cool. but I definitely want to have you do a piece for us, whatever piece sure. you, you, you like to I do. Will I don't do, know what we're gonna get. I will do what I've been starting all my shows with. This piece is called Libation. Oh. Um, the afterlife is speculation, from heaven and hell to reincarnation. When I realized we are one organism, that led to my decision to make people my religion. To be an ancestor honored in remembrance because the seeds I planted are harvested by descendants, helping generations I won't see, that's a miracle. Nothing in this world could be more spiritual because heaven exists in the mind of the living. It's where you'll be if you're kind and giving. To put our ancestors in that final destination, we are here to pour libation. So pour it out. We'll never forget, so never fear. For homies who ain't here, we pouring out a beer. Pour it out. Because of you, it'll never be the same. We keep saying your name while we pour champagne. Pour it out for the mothers and the father figures. Your flames to flicker, we pouring out some liquor. Pour it out for the sons and the daughters of heroes and martyrs. We honor you by pouring out some water. Because heaven exists in the mind of the living. It's where you'll be if you're kind and giving. To put our ancestors in that final destination, we're here to pour libation. This is how it works. Ancestors aren't buried in the dirt. It's not metaphor. It's not simile. I'm talking spiritually to scientifically. I mean, literally. The in our DNA, they're alive in the things that we do and say. Lessons they taught and examples they gave. Last pass when they are buried in their grave. So I try to understand and remember them. Learn from the lives I know I can depend on them. From when the lights turn on to when it fades to black. Our lifespan shorter than a finger. And that's time. I'll never get back. So I use that time to keep the circle intact. Death will feel like before you were born. In Energy doesn't die, it transforms. Heaven exists in the mind of the living. It's where you'll be if you're kind and giving. To put our ancestors in our final destination, we are here to pour libation. Thank you very much. That's what I'm talking about. That's what we're here for, to pour some libations. Definitely, definitely. Um, we should probably start off asking the, and this is the thing. When you know uh -huh. an artist, right? So sometimes it's difficult. So I have to really think about interviewing you as someone that I don't know, right? And mm -hmm. trying to, even if I ask you questions that I already know the answers to, um, the people who are watching, they don't know those answers. So when you, I have to, I'm, I'm going to break down your bio, but let me just start with the, the regular question, right? right How right. long have you been writing? Oh, writing? Um, shoot, as long as I can remember. Um I was writing raps all the way back in middle school. Like the kids in my block, we all separated into different crews and battled each other back when you had to make tapes by, you know what I'm saying, pausing and, and, and repeating on a tape recorder. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I was writing rhymes that far back. I believe when I was like 18 or 19, um, a girl I was seeing at the time took me to a Kaffa house um, on oh, wow. U Street. And um, that's when like like seeing that vibe and like, being a part of that vibe made me really start taking um writing seriously i think like a lot of guys i started writing um trying to get the ladies attention and then hmm. um 
I was like, oh, no, I can really do something with this. Like, I can get out a whole bunch of different concepts and ideas. And, yeah, so, wow. I, I mean, seriously, since I was 18 or 19, like I said, my introduction wow. to the Kaffa House set it off. That's that's amazing. The Kaffa so, House and Bar None. Boom. And Bar None, right? Yeah. So, um, I don't know how old you are, but I'm pretty sure I'm older than you. Mm. Um, what was it like growing up? Was U Street era like when I moved here? Let me yeah. say I, I I grew up in Mobile, Alabama, for preference for people that they don't know, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I I moved to Virginia in, at 21, right? But the art scene when I moved to this area in 2000, there was a popping art scene, right? This is U Street after I saw um, what's the word? What's the uh, show? Um, a thin Love line joke? between. Okay, got you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, love and hate. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. A thin line between love and hate when they were talking about Chocolate City. I had yes. never heard that before. Whatever yeah. year that was, right? Yeah. So I'm like, oh, so there's like black, like black, black people, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like in one place. So what was your experience like with, with that? Right. So that was in your younger days. Yeah. So um, so I to to let you figure out how old I am, I graduated high school in 1996. Um, I went to Largo High School. Um, very Prince George's County to let you know how Prince George's County we are. When I graduated, they played pomp and circumstances to a go to a go-go beat. All wow. right. To a, to a pocket beat. All right. Um, we would have done a socket beat, but it was a formal event. So we had to chill it out. So yeah, that's, wow. that's how PG County we were. And, um, I went to University of Maryland. My life has revolved around Howard University. When we get into more of my biography, literally, like I, I need some kind of honorary Howard stamp because literally my family exists because of Howard University on every level. Um, but I went to the University of Maryland, um, which was an interesting um, contrast because at Largo High School, I remember all, it was like 500, 300 in the graduating class. I remember one um, white person, one white girl in my class. It was like a white guy. I don't remember his name. Um, her name was Jennifer Kaika out of 300 kids. I remember her name. Just her, because, of course. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but I went to Maryland, which for me was a little bit of a culture shock because growing up so PG County, I I could forget that I was a minority. Um, uh, um, but all the kids at the University of Maryland who were trying to be a part of art, who were meeting at the New Borough Cultural Center, were the ones who actually introduced me to the poetry scene at U Street. Um, but U Street is literally right up the street from like where my whole family is from in Northwest and Northeast. You know what I'm saying? Like I knew it from driving through when I in, in my video for the hustle. Um, I got I got um, uh, uh, Deacon Joiner. Deacon Joiner was my tag taxi cab driver during a video that I, I, I have called the hustle when we went up and down U Street. And um, just to tell you how old school he was, he was like, yeah, when I first moved here, that spot spot right there was a pool hall. And I was like bruh that's ben's chili bowl he was wow. like, <laughs> he was like wow. he was like well i got out the war in 51 i was like all wow. right, all right. i was like all right all right so so but yeah the kids at the university of maryland specifically my girlfriend at the time had put me on the u street and um i had always you know played the instruments i played drums and i played piano i took a little bit of lessons in piano but really i'm from one of those small storefront churches where i was the musician in the church and i got to you know play my music like that i always tried to rap but my 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 boys never you know hyped me up as a really good rapper they always like yo your rhymes are good but your raps your actual flow you got to work on (laughs) um so i kind of floated into spoken word really easily once I learned about Bar None and Kaffa House and was down there on a regular basis. I actually started a band um, with my best friend's brothers, my best friend um, who moved to Prince George's County um, and Washington, D.C. because his father is the dean of the chapel at Howard University. And so when I'm telling you my whole life is revolved about Howard University, I'm, I'm really trying to tell you it's like it's ridiculous, right? My right. parents met at Howard University. My father came here to go to Howard University. Um, I was born at Howard University Hospital. Hmm. Um, I met my ex-wife at Howard University. Um, my wife is from Howard, <laughs> to Howard yeah. University. When I tell you my family, like, yeah, so that whole section of town, I'm up and down there all the time anyway, right? And this weekend <laughs> was Howard University. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Maybe that's also why I was fresh in my head. And so I started a band with my best friend's younger brothers. 
Um, it was called 420 Louder. Um, so I don't know how you know familiar you are with the current DC scene, but people like um, we were the we were collaborating. We still got the album we never released. We were collaborating with Deborah Bond, with Raheem mm -hmm. Devon. Um, this is right. back in 98, 99, 2000. You know what I'm saying? I was playing drums behind them. Um, I was writing poetry and stuff and performing with them. So um, I've been like, that was my intro, intro into the music scene. Like just this vibrant, you know, going to see um, Ra, uh, Raquel at Mangoes. Mm -hmm. um, what else is going on? Um, Spit that started like maybe right after the 2000s. Um, but yeah, just being a part of that scene and like I said, seeing people who started from that scene who are still full time musicians, like it's very encouraging to see full time artists. Mm -hmm. The spoken word poet, like, like, um, uh, just like when I when I first started doing uh Arts Under the Stars on Georgia Avenue, not too far from U Street, I consider it all part of the same scene, right? Like, it is. like a lot of people, um. Uh, uh, pages his first his first open mic was coming to my thing at Mawanaj. Um, Sonia Renee first started coming out the poetry, coming to my stuff. You know what I'm saying? So um, I'm really like, I'm I'm really I'm really excited about 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 having to have been a part of this scene and the legacy that's a part of the scene and the people that I've learned from and the people that I've I've given opportunities to all as a part of the scene. So thank you for jogging that memory for me. I forget how far back I go and how much fun I've had doing. Yeah. That. Yes, yeah. you know, because the feeling of it, you know, I, I, I can't I can't explain. I mean, it, you, you definitely you brought up uh, Love Jones and that was my first time seeing yeah. someone do poetry with a djembe drum with it. I was like, people stand up. <laughs> I said, people stand up and do where where do they do that? That's exactly. what I that's what I wanted. That's what I want to do. So exactly. and, you know, being entrepreneurs and stuff like that. That's when I when I saw that, whatever year that was, it was a, a light for me, right? As cliche yeah. as it sounds, it wasn't the poetry because I already had poetry. It was people do this for a living. People yeah, stand up in front of the people, audience. It's and the, it's, it's the it's audience and they want to hear that. Yeah. So, so. Kaniki, I'll I'll tell you how much, and I think you think you know about this, uh uh, how much of a fan I was. I was putting out a whole bunch of free mixtapes, and one of the free mixtapes I put out is called Bomani Arma is Darius Love Hall and Love Jones the Date Mixtape. And I wow. got a whole bunch, and I got a whole bunch of the U Street scene to be different characters from the movie. Um uh Sonia Renee, uh B Sharice, um Femi the Dry Fish. Uh, Drew Anderson, Patrick Washington. Um, we did a whole mixtape based off of the music from the soundtrack of that movie. Um, wow. And, what was and, I? I, didn't, I don't have this. I don't have this in my life. Uh, it, it's it's free. You can get it off of Bandcamp. I'll send you the link. As a matter of fact, send I'll the link. Quick and send you the link. And send so I, I asked all, all of your favorite U Street poets to play a character from Love Jones. Um, and they did. They all pay, I all told them, you know, which character from Love Jones I wanted them to write a poem as. And um, and I wrote it, and actually, and honestly, and a lot a lot of it is being ironic. Um, because I think as much as I loved Love Jones and I, I love um, you know, yeah, it affect you know, you know what people forget about that movie is that um the two biggest, you know, Lorenz Tate and Nia Long mm -hmm. were both coming off of being like hood movie stars. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like some movies we love. And then they did this like middle-class, artsy, full-time artist, black people in an urban setting. You know what I'm saying? And we were like, mm -hmm. oh. Right. Like some, and you know, and I guess you were probably around the same age when it first, when, that, oh, what was I? 18 when it came out. I was like, oh, this could be life. You know what I'm saying? Um, And so part of the mixtape was about, and I just put it in the chat, uh, Part of the mixtape was being ironic um, about, <laughs> about how bad of a love story the movie is. Um, it is a great movie. It is a bad love story. There's no way those two characters ended up together. They were very toxic to each other the entire way through the movie. But it was a beautiful movie and a very interesting story. But part yeah, of the yeah. mixtape is like breaking that, the, the, the concept of what their relationship was kind of down. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 I, I forgot to mention when, before I started this, I have a six month old. She's always my co-host. Co so if Got you hear you. a baby uh, talking, whining, doing whatever she do in the background, you see? I hate that. Hey, well, I have a five year old, so that's kind of, you know, she, she does it more consciously, but she will definitely come in here and interrupt. I <laughs> cannot believe she's five. The time. She's closer, she's closer to six. She's closer to six. I cannot believe she's that old. That time just flew, flew, yeah. flew, flew, flew by, flew by. Yeah, it did. Yeah, it did. Um, speaking of parenthood, 
right? Yeah. I, I hate to see congratulations. I haven't congratulated you enough. I know you were really Thank excited you. about having a baby. I know that's like yes. a big deal having that family happening. So congratulations. Yes. And thank you, you know, for offering to hold her. Um, even though I, I didn't, you know, she's she's so good, she's really good on stage and stuff like yeah. that. But you know, yesterday my friend Miko and my friend Asha held her while I was putting on an event. Mm-hmm. And just having somebody that you know you could trust to be like, hey, I can hold your baby is a is trust me. I don't let everybody hold her, but That's just having somebody just offer when you're trying to do everything, yes, yeah. it's a lot. And she's she's really good in the crowd, thank God. You know, I can take her on the stage, but she's doing a lot of babbling right now. So yeah, she, it's, she's it's, gotta be doing spoken word before she can walk. So she, I'm, I'm telling you, she's gonna be like she her first her first word gonna be haiku. <laughs> 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 we're gonna see and then we'll see what she say after that so yeah yeah it is it is a true situation so let me let me start with what did you do as an artist right we're gonna come back to your bio what did you do when the pandemic came this what you see behind me so my basement was my recording space and it was something i was working on slowly um when the pandemic happened so what i do as a what my regular lack of a better word, my my nine to five, the biggest hustle that I have as an artist is being a teaching artist. So I go into different schools all over the country. I am a CETA artist. You got it right. Um, um, There's an educational thing at at, uh, the Kennedy Center where they bring in teaching artists and the teaching artists uh, teach all these different um, teachers who come in from all 50 states. And then when they go back home, they give me a call. I'm like, yo, come to my state and come, you know what I'm saying? Do do your thing. So I've been I've been flown out to Florida, to California, to Texas, to I've been flown. I keep getting invitations from Hawaii, but they never follow through. <laughs> but I was I was in the midst of beginning to travel the country doing what I do as a teaching artist. And when it all shut down, like literally my um my rent money kind of just evaporated in a series of emails over a day, right? Right. But right. One of the one of the states that I was supposed to have gone to was West Virginia. And West Virginia, they didn't cancel my my visit. What they did was they said they were going to pay me and instead of room and board money, they were going to use that money to buy video equipment and ask me to make videos that they could use to broadcast for their students. And they were like, they were going to broadcast it for real because some of the places that I was going to supposed to be in didn't even have internet access. They were going to put it over public, you know what I'm saying, old school bunny ear antennas so the kids could get the lessons that way. So I already knew a little bit about video editing, um, and then I just was down here during COVID figuring out how to make music videos. If you ever see my educational Baba Got Bars hip hop videos, they were all made in a green screen here in the basement with money that was paid, you know, given to me through Story Tapestries. Oh, yeah. My, my homegirl, Ariana Ross, who was always looking out for teaching artists and independent artists and made that happen. And so um, I honestly like a lot of people in my position, artists were just trying to figure out how to scramble and figure out, you know, how to. um. I think I was fortunate to to understand that I just needed to, instead of trying to find other gigs, I just perfected how to present what I do online. So I spent mm. the first three months of the pandemic um, perfecting how to do what I do online instead of finding, like I was going to go maybe do Lyft or, you know, just, just find another gig. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I was like, nah, I, I spent the first three months because because here's what it was. My plan is to move out of the country, is to repatriate back to Africa. That's my long-term world domination plan. And so my long-term plan was to be able to teach classes anywhere from Kenya or anywhere from Ghana. So I had a five-year plan on how to teach what I do online. Um, COVID turned that five-year plan into a three-month plan. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Instead of working once a week on how to do it, boom, 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 boom. So then... I got a PPP loan. I didn't cheat nobody. I ain't getting a Lamborghini or nothing. I just paid my rent <laughs> for a couple months. Um, I got a PPP loan. And then that tided me over through summer. And then when school came back, with everybody still on lockdown, but they were doing school virtually, people started calling me to do virtual, right? And it became very apparent to everyone over the summer and into September that I was doing virtual teaching on a whole nother level because I had been taking all of March, February, April, May, just figuring out how to do it, doing all the screen screen. Um, I had learned just as a performer to not perform um, over tracks um, live. If What I do is I'm like, yo, this is the song, Mm -hmm. this is the call and response, and then I press play on a video. And the video Uh, comes across much better than me, you know what I'm saying? Because everybody was like- That's better. 
And I learned the, that the music, yeah, the music, it doesn't translate well when you're trying to speak over it. It doesn't exactly. translate well. Exactly. And so, and so I was spending all my time like making all the trials and errors at the very beginning of COVID. So when everybody came back, word got around quickly that Bomani Arma, that Baba Bomani knows what he's doing. And so I started getting hired not only to teach my class, but to teach teachers how to teach their class and like how to keep their students engaged while using Zoom, while using Google Meets or whatever they were doing, you know what I'm saying? And so, um, and actually like the last, you know, last year, the end of the lockdown um, was one of my best fiscal periods ever. You know what I'm saying? Just because I used to have to pick on either going to Vermont or going to North Carolina or going to Fresno, California. Right. But but during the COVID, I could do, could all, do all three, three right. in the same day. Yeah. yeah. So I actually yeah. got uh, spoiled by the end of COVID being able to, you know what I'm saying, do all that. But it it's taken my whole presentation to another level. Mm -hmm. And so basically, because basically here's what happened. Um, I took my PowerPoint presentations from when I rap in front of students and I turned those PowerPoint presentations into video presentations and turning them into video presentations made them better. Right. But now that I'm going back live, turning them back into PowerPoint has made them even better than it was before. So mm -hmm. like, it's just all these forces working together and me and me and me adapting to them. And it's really just turning me into the uh, artist that I always wanted to be, but I wouldn't have been able to articulate. You know right. what I'm saying? That you, you know, kind of set you down and 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 focused and focused you, you know, for because I mean we we had no idea what we were doing. I this this platform started off as a Facebook post, and I mm -hmm. said, "Do I now have?" Because like you, all of my I have I was into my second year as poet laureate, right? Uh -huh. At home, gotcha. Y'all can't do everything. Whatever my plan was going to be, and I and I made a post and said. Do I need to something like do I need to make everything virtual? I need to make everything virtual. And then uh Charity, uh Sherry and Danielle all hit me up. And, and my good friend um Laura DeFranco all hit me up on that post. I was like, let's do something. So Laura and I were doing open mics, and then we had a we that night, Charity, like, let's talk tonight. So we were like on Google Hangout saying like what, what platform we put this on and then we put it on zoom which was whack we had nobody had any idea we was like we're just gonna interview each other each other until we yep. find out what we're doing yeah then so this this that's how this platform was created and then all of our friends you know the talam aces the seku um you know drew anderson pages all of these people who we knew that um you know we're making it in in the artist world had time now so that now they can come on here and we can interview them and find out how did you that's funny such that's such. real right. so it's and then everybody was tuning in right and then after that we we're like are we going to keep this because we're back live we're going to keep it but we've gotten such a great response right being able to talk to an artist is a thing that we don't get to do right you don't get to do that you know you have to move along when people are selling product you get to yep. ask one question yep. so it's 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 been it's been a great platform for us and and for me like you said being in three places at in one day has been great you know and not having to move around so much has been great Pl plenty yeah. of gas money and introducing to you know being introduced to a different crowd has been yeah. the, inter the internet has been good so thank you COVID you thought you had messed us up but you had blessed us I so you know and that that's weird because that's I've I've been careful on how I how I how I talk about that because it has been weird like it it um it was devastating but at the same time being able to adapt to it made 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 me figure out a whole different level you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. so yeah not nah, you know trials and tribulations coming to, through the other side of them makes you a different better hardened you know, fine tuned mm -hmm. artists. And I think we both were blessed and fortunate had, to come out the yeah, other side. Yeah, we all had like, to figure it out. I mean, I couldn't yeah. let a whole year of term of a poet laureate just go by just go without by. doing anything, right? So no I had doubt. to try to create things online to try to figure out, you know, anything. Right. I was like, I don't want my entire term to be gone and I don't do anything. So right, right, definitely, right, right. definitely. And that was on everybody over my, I ain't get on nobody's slams because you ain't, you ain't about to hurt my feelings. I ain't get on those. I watched them, but I ain't, I ain't compete on no virtual slam. I was like, mm-mm. I'm going to yep. need my audience. So, you know, shout out to everybody who did that. But listen, you talked about being a teaching artist. Yes. What? How How does one become a teaching artist? Do you look for a job on, on Indeed and say, hey, I can do that? How do we do that? Um. So hopefully one of my, another one of my, my reoccurring theme is my plot for world domination. Um. One of my career goals is to make it easier for other people to become teaching artists. 
um, the thing that I am as a teaching artist is what I wanted to be when I was 18, but it didn't exist mm -hmm. and the term right. wasn't there. And if if I had to all do it, like, so I love meeting 18 year olds and we connect and it was like, ah, this is blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? Um, I became a teaching artist because um, I wanted to be an artist and then I went to school to be a teacher and then I was disillusioned with the idea of being a teacher. And then I had some initial success being an artist. <laughs> and then I needed a part-time job when my initial success being an artist, you know, wasn't completely, you know, paying all the bills. And so I was like, well, hey, I'm good with kids. And they all kind of came together. I started it working for the Crushed Ice program, an after-school program with Timothy Jones at Martha's Table, another U Street staple. It's not on U Street anymore, but it used to be on U. It used to be on 14th between B and W Street. So basically U Street. You know what I'm saying? It's Caddy Corner to Busboys and Poets on 14th and B Street. Um, as a matter of fact, for two years, um, my ex-wife and I lived above Martha's table. They had an apartment that they would rent to employees extremely inexpensively. So I lived on U Street, like right at the turn of the millennium. Oh my God, I can't believe I said it out loud like that. Um, Right at the turn of the millennium, I lived on U Street and I taught at the after school program there. That's where I met Chris Styles Bacon, Grammy nominated, big deal. Uh, Chris Styles, I met him there as a 15 year old um, with a whole bunch of other talented hip hop artists. And, you know, as an after school program, they didn't pay me a lot, um, but they had money in their budget for equipment. And they were like, what do you need to make beats and show the kids how to make beats? What do you need to make music videos? Show the kids how to make music videos. And so basically Martha's Table was kind of my school on how to figure it out. And then I would watch Tim Jones um, do the, the writing classes with the kids. And at the time, I'm still working with my band that's, you know, got Raheem Devon playing with us and Deborah Bond mm -hmm. playing with us. And so, you know, I'm still an artist. I'm still sort of making it as an artist, but, you know, um, I needed a job. And so those two things came together and, it, and and when I say I need a job, I need a job that's not going to drive me crazy. Um, I could have gotten a job like I'm a very, you know, I have good, um, what do you call it? Customer service. I speak well. You know what I'm saying? I type really right. fast. Um, I could have gotten really good jobs, but I also know I needed something that like satisfied me mentally and emotionally all the time. I figured I could go somewhere when I was younger and have made six figures, but I would have spent half of it on habits trying to get my mind off of whatever I did all day that I didn't like to do. So, you know, I love working with young people. I love making art and Martha's Table allowed me to do that. You know what I'm saying? And it was a, just a, a fortunate moment. And then out of Martha's Table, um, I was making art there and... Um, I started working with a video production company, Park Triangle, which is actually a big deal in Washington, D.C. right now. Mm -hmm. Started working with them. And um, uh, I started working on Read a Book. Um, the kids, if you listen to it, you're probably going to come to Read a Book in a minute. But when you listen to Read a Book, the other voices in the background are my students at Martha's Table. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh. They were all teenagers. Um, and we were having fun with that. They were all yelling and screaming. We were having fun with that. Um, and then when read a book took off, that kind of solidified me as a, you know, artist, as a full-time artist, man. Matter of fact, I think sometimes in my head, I think of read a book before Martha's Table, but Martha's Table happened and read a book happened in the midst of it. And then also my, um, my read good a book friend was in 2007. Yeah. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. So, so read a book hit in 2007. I probably wrote it in 2005. Okay. I probably wrote it near the end of 2005. That's back when Lil John ran the world. And um, <laughs> it was actually good timing because if I had waited any longer, read a book, little, the whole Lil John phenomenon was, was, was fading a little bit. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so the, all, basically a confluence of all those things happening, me being a teacher, me being an artist, all happening at once. And then, you know, as I'm being an artist, you know, every time I needed a part-time gig, I was teaching after school programs. Um, my homegirl, Cheryl Hart Johnson at the National Organization of Concerned Black Men hired me to do uh, sex education classes with hip hop as the basis back in the early 2000s. That was a huge deal. Um, and and I just started, you know, imagining how I could make hip hop an even more inter 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 integral part of the educational program. Um, for a lot of people, art is like the frosting on the cake. And I wanted to make it like the um, the actual ingredients. Um, and so I'd been working on that for a minute. And then 
My big break as a teaching artist was doing a public access television show where the other guest was Pat Cruz, who used to work for um, Young Audiences of Maryland, which is now Arts for Learning Maryland. And she told me I needed to link up with them. And I did. And like, almost like that's where the montage starts. You know what I'm saying? You know, wow. I, when the montage in the movie is like, he started doing this and that and this and that. Um, Arts for Learning is based in Baltimore. You should, um, there, there is a version in Virginia, but um, every arts for, every young audiences or Arts for Learning is different from state to state. Um, the state of Maryland takes art integration very seriously. I tell people all the time, I mean, half of my career success is me being smart enough to have been born in DC and raised in Prince George's County. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like that was the best decision I ever made was to be, you know, born here because like Maryland spends a lot of time and energy trying to put art in the classroom. And so mm -hmm. it met me at the right time when I was doing it and they sat me down with a librarian and an English teacher and my lesson plan and really helped me flesh out like how to, um, how to make it so that, the art isn't just frosting on the cake, that it's actually the cake that you're serving to the students. And mm -hmm. now like teachers get credit now for um, coming to take my class all over the country. When I fly into the country oh, and wow. I, when I fly in That's and amazing. they were like, and when I fly in and there's like, yeah, this is professional development. If you come take my class for an hour and a half or three hours, it gives you credit towards your certification as being able to do art integration in the classroom um, because it's it's literally stuff you can use in the classroom. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I said all that to say, to be a teaching artist, you have to be both a teaching teacher and an artist. artist. You know what right. I'm saying? And, and I mean that in the sense that like, I, so if you notice I'm black, right? Um, really? I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. My, my parents, well, my mom's black. Um, my dad's black too. Um, but, <laughs> but that's how that worked out, right? But But I feel like I am a teacher and an artist the same way I am black, as in I did not choose it. Wow. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's just the energy that I have. It's just what I was going to do, no matter what century or what continent I popped up on. You know what I'm saying? I was going to be those things. And so um, I think, especially in hip hop, there are a lot of people mm -hmm. who aren't really artists. They're just trying to do hip hop. Um, and, I'm, and I've always, it, shoot, the same thing for spoken word. You know this. You There's know. a whole bunch of spoken word artists no. who, aren't really, who aren't really artists, who it, this isn't them at their heart and at their core. And mm -hmm. it's not even hating. Like, you should do, you should do art even if you aren't an, uh, an artist to your okay, core. Right. Artist is good for your soul. You know what I'm saying? But there's some people who are, like, faking, like, this is all they need. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? And, like, I, like, this is all I want to do. And so finding that mix between the two where I'm being a viable commercial artist but also being an asset to my community and making money from doing it like like it, mm -hmm. it just ended up being perfect and so um for everyone who really wants to figure out how to do it more i definitely especially if you're in maryland link up with arts for learning or it used to be called young audiences they're young audience chapters mm -hmm. all over the country um hit me up i love put like like all i do is make raps all day you know what i'm saying like like um there's, when I was younger, I didn't think that I, because I, I, I feel like I am obviously not a Billboard 100 type rapper. So I was trying to figure mm. out how I could make poetry and rap and rhyme and music and still be able to do it full time. And like being able to do a teach, being able to teach. And I've already got more like BET MTV airplay than I ever expected. Mm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There it is. And so like I'm crushing it on every level. You know what I'm saying? I make raps all day and that's all I ever wanted. So, yeah. I was at a Proverbs, you know, band Proverbs. Shout out to Proverb, Proverbs. Yeah, 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 yeah. Band, right? Yep, yep, yep. I was at a Proverbs something party or something, and they it was like at this bar, and they were playing, uh, you know, like is you know how you're at the bar. So the party's going on, the band's playing, but they're showing the TV, like the TVs are on, right? Mm -hmm. So I look up on the TV, CNN is on, and I was like, that's Bone Money. <laughs> That's I was hilarious. like, wait, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I was like, listen, I need to know what, because you know the, the volume is down. Right. I need to know what they're saying. I was like, he's like, we can't turn the music off. We can put the words up there, right? So I'm 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 reading the words, trying to see like on the video, right? I was like, hey, so that's Bomani on, on the TV. On that's the hilarious. TV. I want to know. And and I'm like, okay, and they, they were showing a clip, and I know um Sherry has a, a clip that we uh -huh. Joe. 
of read a book. But they were showing that. Of course, I, I knew the read a book. And I was like, is that? It's, it's, I'm, I'm like blown because there's no, you know, this is a long time ago. So I can't like cue it up on the video. There's no FaceTime that I can FaceTime nobody. I didn't have your phone number to say, hey, I see you on. So I want to know how did the BET and the CNN, how we, how we, how did this happen? What, and then, of course, we know like you released the album because we read that in your bio after that. But, and we know how this, this, now we know how the song came about. But how yeah. did the BET, how did the BET happen? Oh, there, okay. there, share, share, share. No, no, no. Okay, no, no. So, so before we ask, answer that question, now would be a good time to play the video. Boom. Yeah. See, so we're gonna share my. I'm, I'm making sure I'm doing things right because we don't do this often this way. And play. Amen. Share. Make it, not share. Try make it make it full screen. I will. What's up, y'all? <laughs> it's your boy D Mike. <laughs> See, I usually do songs with like hooks and concepts, right? All right, I'm gonna start it over. Come back and start start talking about it. Come back in one minute. I need to start it over. That's well, hilarious. You, you because start it over. Because listen, because we, we don't usually do this, but you know, Sherry was like, yeah. we can. We I can don't do normally that. do this, but uh, go ahead and get the party started. Oh, but for you, <laughs> I will cue it up. <laughs> I appreciate that. And of Thank course, you. in this moment. My computer wants to be what I will define in this moment as extra. Extra. No, well, I, so, so I, you know, what we were talking about earlier is doing a whole bunch of stuff virtual. I know right now you're doing a bunch of stuff on your computer. You've got four yes. feeds coming in and that playing on YouTube. So, <laughs> yeah. All right. you know it. Here we go. Let me full screen. System audio. I love how but Bo Bo money gonna teach him or he gonna tell us how to do it. Sorry. You, better, <laughs> you don't know. You don't know. We don't be doing it. <laughs> and here we go. Yeah. What's up, y'all? <laughs> it's your boy D Mike. <laughs> See, I usually do songs with like hooks and concepts, right? I'm trying to go platinum. Somebody go rock this shit. Check this out, y'all. Uh, read a book, read a book, read a book. Read a book, read a book, read a book. Read a book, read a book, read a book. Read a book, read a book, read a book. Yeah, that's a bunch of ridiculousness. Thank you very much. <laughs> My friend uh it uh it uh Texas. I said I'm 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 gonna interview Bo Money and she was like, read a book. I was like, that is funny, that is hilarious. That you know what I'm saying that you know that you know this, right? You know, because that's somebody who lives in Houston, Texas, and she's like, read a book, read a book. I was like, Yeah. I just saw on TikTok, um, this this lady was like, uh, yo, this is how you know. My, this is how you know our childhood was lit. This was on TV when I was in the sixth grade, and she played read a book. I wow, jeez, like, like yeah, that's what in it is. Sixth grade, that's what it is. And in she was grown, grade. and she was grown, grown. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that lets you know, like you'd be like, oh, it's age, it's age. Yeah, it's yeah. Age. time keeps on ticking into the future. It's well, thing. listen, you you've been drinking good water. You know, you, you look good. It, it must you. be the watermelon and everything that you you're eating. And mind of my today. business, those old and black mind women. And mind of your business. And those old black women were not joking about like the key. <laughs> <laughs> to mind your business. To Drink mind your water. Business. And mind and your business. Yeah. Hold on. Here's the water. 
Yes. And the water. And the sleep. And the sleep. You gotta get good sleep. You gotta get good sleep. I need to do better on the sleep. I got, you know, world domination is taking up more more time than I anticipated. That's what's happening? Yeah, yeah. That's what's happening? Okay, so we talk, let's see. We talked about teaching artists a little bit. We talked about a little bit about the hip hop, hip hop um, songwriting. We 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 got that. We know we know that you're a poet. But um, what is what is the, the the sense behind the not a rapper, not a rapper dot com? Why not a rapper? You know something, and it's honestly, and this is like maybe the only the second time I've said this out loud. It's actually a moniker I'm sort of growing out of. Um, as I said earlier, like all my friends used to say I was a really good writer. Um, um, and so I, but I loved writing rhymes, but you know, I didn't rap a lot. So I wasn't like a rapper. And the other major reason is because I started doing it in the classrooms and the kids was like, you're a rapper. Where's your chain? Where's your car? Where are your girls? I'm like, really? oh no, that's, you know what I'm saying? So it all kind of worked on like, I'm not a rapper. I'm a poet with a hip hop style. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because I would do. Um, a whole bunch of I would write I would write rhymes and spit them at spoken word spots. And so when I spit them over a beat, they would work. But since I was doing them at spoken word spots and, you know, spoken word spots, you don't have a beat to hide behind. And so it makes my lyrics, you know, what I'm saying I feel like it makes my lyrics that much tighter. Um, But I've been rapping a lot recently. So like not a rapper is not as much of like, yeah, yeah I've been rap. I like. I was just looking at like the catalog of what I released recently and like I haven't done anything spoken word. Um, the only thing I do that spoken word is if I go to a spoken word spot and I do my raps a cappella. Um right. uh, but um, but it does come from just like I I connect my lineage as a writer beyond hip hop. I love hip hop, you know what I'm saying? I love um outcast and most deaf and krs1 and rock him mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. dead prez and you know what i'm saying and q-tip and fife dog and and scarface and like that's that's those are the people who got me really interested in and in like lyricism but mm -hmm. i connect myself back to uh claude mckay and langston hughes and you know what i'm saying like i mm -hmm. want to make sure that you know my writing can connect to all the way I, I feel as a writer that i'm not just hip-hop I'm poetry. I'm I'm Frederick Douglass. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm Ida B. Wells. I'm a journalist. Um, I'm an activist. I'm a speechwriter. Um, and so I want to make sure that I don't just connect to hip hop. I connect to the whole lineage of African American writers, mm -hmm. um, and African writers. And so that that's mm -hmm. part of where the title came from. How has how long have you been a father? Did I say father. Yeah. Father? So. What what is it? Uh, what are you, what are you 16, 16 years and five months. Sixteen about. years and five months. Sixteen years and four months. Yeah, something like that. There there is a and I've got and I've got a baby on the way. I know I'm not showing right baby now, on the way. But I got baby a baby on December, the way. December, right? Yeah. December. Yep. December. Yep. December. 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 Is it a girl? December. It's a boy. 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 Yeah. It's a boy. So, I was gonna say, yeah, kind of, I got some baby clothes over here. That's what I was asking. <laughs> Like you want, want these baby clothes? That's what I was about to ask. I know how but, that works. Yep. Uh, yeah, you said you had a baby the way I was. Like, oh, this there is a expectation. I'm gonna mm -hmm. say that when a woman artist has a child, that she must then stop her artistry and mother. You see it happening all the time. It's like you know you got to be home with your child, right? How has is was that expectation? Have you found that that was an expectation of you? Like if you were out without your children, they say, where, where you know, where are your kids? Or um, did you have to stop being an artist to be to then father your children for a certain amount of time? Um, so yeah, um, I, I, I want I, to know how how was that received? In I would honestly family? tell you that I I probably um am with my children more than a lot of artists of my stature probably are. They're probably out at night a lot more often. I had my children and I like them. I want to be around them. You know what I'm saying? I homeschooled my sons for a very long time. Um, A lot of what I do as a teaching artist is birthed out of what I did for a whole bunch of homeschooled African-American boys. Um, And so part of my artwork is a response to my interaction with my children. Um, You know, 
um, either directly about them or about the questions they've asked or about me worried about the world that I'm leaving them. Um, but I do know I spend a lot of time with my children. And like I said, I created them and I like them and I would rather be with them than anybody else. And so it wasn't, so it's not like a sacrifice. And I think one of the advantages of being a teaching artist, like literally, and I, I need to figure out, I need to talk to my tax accountant, like playing with my daughter is research and development. Right. You know what I'm saying? And I'm right. blessed. I am blessed that that's my life, that I can like mm -hmm. take time in the middle of the day and play with my daughter. And it's completely like justified a, because I want to play with my daughter B because my daughter needs my time and C what I'm learning from drawing and making beats with my daughter turns into lesson plans. You know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? And so like, I'm, I'm living the dream right now. It's extra cool. Yes, that is cool. Did you, did you find that you needed to censor yourself because you have children and you were afraid of what you put out may then circle back around to them and say, did your, did your parent write this? So um, there's nothing that I've ever written that I wouldn't play for my children. There's stuff that I've written that I wouldn't advise people to play for their children until they heard it first. <laughs> But there's literally nothing I've ever written that I would not play for my children. People, when they curse around my sons, they always apologize. I'm like, dude, my sons mm -hmm. have heard read a book. Like, we're good. You right. know what I'm saying? I, I've i taught my sons how to curse correctly. I didn't want my kids to be like the ones <laughs> cursing wrong. Um, and so and they, and I don't think that they curse a lot. I think they do some, but I think they, the, the cachet, the ooh, you're cursing, like it doesn't mm -hmm. really... Um, it doesn't really work in my house. Um, you get more in trouble in my house of saying something actually offensive, whether or not it's has profanity in it or not. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. um, but 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 um, what I'm really working on is trying to figure out how to brand. And this is even trying to explain it. Um, it sounds more salacious than it is how to brand the kitty educational version of me separate from Bomani, the grown man version of me. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Like Bomani, the grown man version of me, all I want to talk about is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> like that's all I want to talk about. You know what I'm saying? And I do. Um, I don't have to end and Bomani, the, the educator has gotten into a lane where like my rhymes and my lesson plans are literally as part of the curriculum is in some school systems, right? Um, but some people can't like have would have a problem Separate. separating them right Separate. so they might they would run into bomani um rapping about his political opinion or rapping about you know what he plans on doing with his wife later that night you know what i'm saying and they'll be like oh my gosh bomani the teacher is like uh, and i'm like yeah um but like I have one thing for the kids and one thing for the adults. And so like one of the things I'm working really hard. And I think one of the reasons maybe sometimes I've delayed my own progress is trying to make sure I can keep those two lanes separate. So like I perform as Bomani Arma, AKA the watermelon man for the mm -hmm. grown folks. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, I tell my people all this, this all the time. Like um, if you hear a song, if you hear my voice in the song, um, if you hear me say Baba Bomani, babagapbars.com, guarantee you there's no controversy everything right. in the song is like stamped and approved and you can play it for your kid at any time if you just hear me say bomani or ma i would play it for my kids but <laughs> i would suggest you listen to it first, <laughs> first before you play it for your kids just so you don't say Bo bob you know bomani or ma set you up you know what i'm saying because right. i right. i am liable to say i'm liable to say what i'm really thinking so yeah right. that's how it works word word yeah, yeah. I think it's best to keep it real, but that's a whole, that's a whole, a, a different thing. But since you brought up the watermelon man, uh -huh. I'm glad that you did. Thank you. This man has, I don't know where, he has watermelon from God. You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> well, I don't know what kind of, I don't know where he got this watermelon from, right? But uh, yeah, if when, when the watermelon season is around, definitely hit up Bo Money or Boom. some watermelon because- Boom. I take that listen, stamp. Definitely, and you from the it. south, so I'll take and that. And I'm from the south, right? Because you know, I'll take that stamp. Yes, I was like, and and I, I, um, for years, my husband never ate watermelon, so okay. I went about this. I got this big watermelon, right? Of course, I can't eat it all, so I called my friend. I said, Hey, you come down here and get half of this watermelon, right? So, this the day that I'm giving away half of the watermelon, it's the day that 13 decides, Let me taste this watermelon. You know, it's been years since I said, He was like, He started eating, he was like. That's 
kind of good. So now I got to share half of my half That's hilarious. with my husband. Now he on the watermelon, right? Now he back on the watermelon. But That's I hilarious. want to know, like, how did watermelon, well, what, you didn't start watermelon day. Right, right, But right. how did the whole, I'm going to sell some watermelon, people are going to call me the watermelon man, and I'm going to do this yearly event. How did this, how did this happen? So, so I'm I'm so glad you asked me that question after the read a book question because it reminds me to connect the two because they they both happen together and it connects back to me being so PG County and blah 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 right. So part of what happened with read a book, um, and oh, you would ask me about CNN. Um, so it had blown up like that whole that whole moment on CNN was magical. Like first of all, I didn't know that they were trying to ambush me. My father called me. While I was on, while I was in the green room, and it's like, yo, they're playing you like next to Sesame Street, and they're gonna come at you, right? Oh wow! But what, what they didn't know, and you couldn't hear it because you were in the club listening to the proverb, right? They had brought on this this brother that they thought was going to attack me for doing read a book, for putting profanity and all this stuff. They thought he was going to attack me. His name is Paul Porter. CNN didn't know that I already knew Paul Porter. Me and Paul Porter were friends. On the ride to CNN, Paul Porter called me. He was like, yo, they're bringing me on to ambush you. I'm just letting you know that I'm not. I'm just going to serve you a, a, a alley-oop. And so, like, if you go back and look at the interview, it is so perfect. And it look it looks like I've... It looks like I like played it well, but just like the universe conspired in my favor. You know what I'm right. saying? Like the guy they brought on to attack me was like, yeah, I'm not attacking you at all. But they're going to when they throw it to me, I'm gonna be like, I don't have a problem with it. And they're going to throw it back to you. So be ready. <laughs> and that's exactly what wow. happened. And so but part of the feedback that I got from read a book and I, and I really do need to break this down more, you know, even for my own social emotional understanding of how I operate. Um. A lot of the feedback I was getting from black people, like my cousins would call me from Ohio and places like that. And it was like, you know, you put this song out with all these images and this idea of what's wrong, you know, with black people, blah, 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 blah. And for me, the message of read a book, where do you order it, raise your kids was secondary to the joke of just how ridiculous crunk music everything was. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it wasn't even the like- only, The I only thing I heard you say in the words, right? Because they they, they, they tried, I tried to get some volume on there was, right. my, my children absolutely understand satire. That's the only yes. thing I heard you say. Yes. You know, it, yes. it wasn't a go, it wasn't a go. That's the only thing I heard you say. It wasn't a go back and play CNN. And there was no YouTube, I can go back and play yeah. it. Right? So I, I, can go, I can go now and look at it. Didn't even right. think about it to go back and look at it. But that's the only words I heard you say. Right. Because the guy was like, yo, how are the kids going to understand satire? I was like, no, they get satire. You know what I'm saying? Um, But the feedback I would get from my cousins from Ohio and, you know, just black people who and they would be like, man, you know, you put that out there. But, you know, what what do white people th you know, what about what the white people think? And I'm like, who cares what white people think? And I had to realize how PG County of me that was. Interesting. Interesting. I had to, like, come to grips with how, like, I don't walk around thinking, like, I, I can go all day and avoid white people. <laughs> and it and it took no effort. And I don't avoid white people. I have no, but because I have this, like, really amicable, I'm, it's so black here that I cannot see white people, that I have a different relationship with what I think white people think of me. But I am not in one of these places where black people are uncomfortable in their blackness because of they've got to they got to make sure they're not one of those black people. Wow. You know what I'm saying? And read a book and people and people reacting that way to read a book. Put that in my face even more. Just like, hey, you have a a I, I, what I, what I call it PG County pampered. You know what I'm saying? Like I have this advantage of just being like now when I talk about black people issues to black people, I'm talking to black people and I don't care right. what white people think. What white people? There are no white, people. white, white people. You know what I'm right. saying? There was like, one white girl in my class. I don't was know. One white girl, one in, my girl class. in my class. Right, right, right. right. And I just realized the comfortability I had in it. Right. So that was part of just the vibe I was feeling. Like the feedback I was getting from my people was like, yeah, but we're out here in the real world where you got to interact with people and you got to keep up appearances, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, that's a very real thing. You know what I'm saying? I That's part of my privilege that I don't have to deal with that all the time. Um, I celebrate the fact that I've noticed that I don't code switch anymore. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like people are coming to me to do hip hop mm. stuff and they're emailing yes, me yes. from multi-million dollar organizations. I'll be like, Hey, what's up? Yeah, I'm cool. That's I'm down. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Cause like, wow. 
I'm completely in my in my vibe. I hear Jay Z brag about him always being in his, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like he's never having to put on to change his thing, you know, for, right, you know. Right. So but I recognize that as a privilege. I recognize that not everybody has that. So then I had a moment where I was at an event, um, and it was me and a whole bunch of white folks and one other brother, and it was a huge watermelon chopped up and on the table, you know, with the food services. And I was joking. I was going to eat the watermelon. There was no, the watermelon was never safe, right? But I joked to the brother that was there. I didn't know him, but I was like, man, I want to eat this watermelon, but there's way too many white folks around. And he was, he got angry. He was like, oh. dude, man, just eat the watermelon, man. Who cares what these white people will think of? Blah, 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 blah. And I, <laughs> and I, felt, con I felt convicted. I was like, yeah, why am, why am I even having this thought? And so that began germinating the idea. And then, um, Brother Singor Bay, because I would start making jokes about watermelon. And, you know, I love watermelon. It's my favorite fruit. And Singor Bay from UNIA, that rhymes, um, said, yeah, watermelon's red, black, and green. The colors of black liberation. I was like, oh. <laughs> He's like, especially if you get the seeds in it. You got to get seeds. the watermelon get the with seeds. the seeds. That's what makes it red, black, and green. And you know me metaphors you know what i'm saying and so being the watermelon man and doing watermelon day is just a living breathing all day every year having an anniversary art project where i'm trying to get black people comfortable dealing with blackness you know what i'm saying we do it in front of a black bookstore i buy watermelons i hire black teaching artists and we just celebrate being black as heck um i love the fact that watermelon day is started by the national watermelon association every organization every fruit every produce has its own like union or board so watermelon has the national watermelon association also known as nwa um, <laughs> once again once again I can't write that. Right. It's so funny. I cannot write that. So then, and then I'm also, you know, this, you know, you know, we you know me personally, you know me on social mm -hmm. media. I'm obsessive. So once it was like, oh, watermelon as a concept and as an extended metaphor, I'm like, oh, where does it go? Where does it go? You know what I'm saying? And so, like, literally, it's red, black, and green. Um, do you know where the stereotype, and you know this because you've seen me explain this at, at shows, but I love mm -hmm. saying this at shows. It's like, okay. do you know where the stereotype that Black people love watermelon comes from? It comes from the historically documented fact that Black people love watermelon. Pretty much. And do you know what's wrong with Black people loving watermelon? Absolutely nothing. Nothing, nothing. right. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And so, and literally, like, um, the stereotype of black people loving watermelon comes from the fact that watermelon was our thing. We were very proud of it. And every summer we would have festivals. And the reason the watermelon tastes, looks, and 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 feels and smells the way it does is because of hundreds of years of my ancestors in South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, wherever we were, Virginia, figuring out how to make the best watermelon. And it, it works so well metaphorically because like a watermelon is almost like a weed. Like, if you just throw watermelon out into the dirt, it'll grow. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, like the like the rose that grows from concrete. Rose, roses growing in concrete is hard as hell. Yeah, pretty pretty much my um the, the baby's having a conversation right now. But um, when I we were not allowed to eat watermelon in the house. Really? Right? I, I never had um watermelon cut off a rhyme. When I was little, I only had watermelon cut off the rhyme when I was like 25. Right? Okay. The way we ate watermelon was in the rind, right? When you cut, you cut it, and you eat it. You 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 eat it, you know, with your hands in the rind. Like I never the way had it you, cut off. The, the way the way it looks in those old racist statues, and that used to be black people's problems with it because they took what we really liked to do and started making fun of us over it. And so some of us, for a small particular period of time, were like, "Let's stop being this thing that white people think we are." And there are certain things that we should stop doing. There are certain things as a culture. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm cutting you off, but you made me think of like where the metaphor goes. Um, there are certain things we should stop doing as a people because we should stop doing them because they're unhealthy for us. But never should we stop doing something because white people said something. That's so, it. right. Well, yeah, because yeah. they're making fun of us about it because that's never mm -hmm. the reason. 
That's mm-hmm. never the reason. So part of Watermelon Man and Watermelon Day is getting to the having the backbone to be like, I'm very yeah. comfortable in this very red, black and green environment. You know what I I'm love saying? It. I, so, love it. Yeah, I was yeah. I was saying I was bringing that up because we we weren't allowed as children to eat it in the house. We ate it on my grandmother's porch in, okay. the, in the backyard. Right. Oh, and then, so we would then spit the seeds to the ground. We never planted watermelon, but just us playing in the yard, beat the seeds down into the ground and grew watermelon. Yep. We weren't even trying to grow it. Wasn't even trying to grow it. Yep. So that, and, that's yep. That's how so I, then, I mean, that's how I ate it. And so then and so then like um and so the watermelon that just grows with no effort is still pretty good. But if you put like years and time and effort and you understand horticulture and you work on the dirt and you graft and you, you know what I'm saying? And you spend decades and you pass it on to your son and then they pass it on to his daughter. And then that's how you like if you look at paintings of watermelons in the 1400s, they do not look like the watermelons from 100 years ago because of hundreds of years of black people messing with it. That's that's the reality of the situation. And it's something we were extremely proud of. And so the idea that white people were like, hey, y'all like watermelon. You know what I'm saying? It was because we liked watermelon. You right. know what I'm saying? And so right. I'm, I'm trying to and I'm trying to extend that metaphor into like um, I joke like uh, I, I don't care what white people think as a hobby. And I want to turn that into being professional. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and 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 I, and I know as a group we struggle with that. You know what I'm saying? On on mm-hmm. some small level, all of us do. Um, and I still do. You know what I'm saying? So I'm right. trying to stomp all that out. And part of the watermelon man is about being comfortable in my blackness. Wow, well, somebody yeah. said Sherry needs that on a t shirt. What part? What part does Sherry need on a t shirt? So listen, your your bio says you are a hip hop artist, a rapper, poet, songwriter, producer, performer. And educator. Yes. When people ask you what you do for a living, what do you say? I make rap songs with kids. You make rap songs with kids. Yep. I um uh I, I rap for adults too, but the kids are what keep the lights on and what I really love to do. Um uh uh rapping for the adults might keeps the gas on. But rapping for the kids keeps the lights in the, in the, and, the rent, <laughs> and the gas and the health insurance and the car insurance. Wow. Um, and so and I and I plan on doing like I have no retirement plan. Um, I plan on doing this until I can't put words together and say them out loud. And so mm. I'm excited about you know the 75 year old version of me and the raps I'm going to be writing then. So hmm. I'm glad yeah. you brought up the 75 year old version of you. What are you doing right now that your older self is going to thank you for? Investing in people. Mm. Investing in children. Um, okay, so I'm going to tell you and your entire audience my world domination plan once again. Um, I'm looking forward to having uh, someone come up to me with their eight year old kids and being like, I saw you when I was eight and I had to bring my kids to see you. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and that's my long term, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's, that's, I'm, I'm excited about that. Um, I'm excited about going into a classroom and hearing a teacher use one of my techniques and not know that it's mine and it doesn't Mm -hmm. even matter. You know what I'm saying? yeah. Yeah. It don't even matter. I just wanted to, I wanted to just keep going, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, And I honestly, like, so I honestly think, you know, I could, you know, retire like normal people do. Um, But I also think, you know, I'm watching the politics and, you know, if the apocalypse happened, (laughs) um, I think I've made enough friends and have enough people around me who love and care for me that I'll be good because I've invested in people instead of, you know, trying to be a hustler all the time. So I think, you know. (laughs) those relationships are very important so i, that's, I think that's what I'm, I'm most excited about what book or movie or song or event um that you went to or read or saw that changed your entire life i could do one for each of those categories um the, oh. what, hit, what hit me first is book and that is um yorugu by marimba ani I think it's because we were just talking about Watermelon Man and the, the struggle of being comfortable in your blackness. And um, 
her book is very good as far as like just changing my 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 mindset and my outlook on how I analyze my life and my people and the problems that black people are going through. Um, Marimba Ani uh, began each chapter of each of her of her book began each chapter of Urugu with a different paragraph from 2000 seasons by Ayikwe Arma, which put me on to read Ayikwe Arma. And when I changed my name to an African name, I decided to use Arma because I so liked the concept he was putting out in, in, in his book, 2000 seasons. Um, but what I loved about Marimba Ani and she's contemporaries with um, the sister who, the mama who wrote um, 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 the ISIS papers is Yurugu was one of the first books. I, I would read a lot of books about like what's what's wrong with the black community. And Yurugu was one of those first books was like, what's wrong with white people? Like, why do they think wow. like that? You know what I'm saying? Like, and and I don't even agree with all her theories, but it's the idea of stop thinking, hey, what did we do to make this happen to us? And she was like, nah, what's wrong with these folks? that they did this and they did that and they did this and she does a and she and she analyzes them psychologically without using um european without using like european psycho and analysis tools which was very interesting to me and i need to go back and read it it's been about a decade since i've like even perused it but i know i read it around the same time i was getting introduced to u street and just the whole concept like threw me off you know what i'm saying like like changed my outlook um, led to read a book, led to the watermelon man, just being like, yeah, what's, what's, what's like, she analyzed the religion and she analyzed the politics and she analyzed a whole bunch of things. Um, and she was insistent on using African words to the, like, she was like, um, we're going to use the word a silly, which means a seed in Swahili, which means the spirit or the essence of. You know what I'm saying? She was very intentionally every time she would talk about something is, you know, this is what they how they describe it. But I'm going to try to say it African. And this is how our African brothers here would have tried to. You know what I'm saying? So I need to read this book. I'm going to get yeah, you. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, it wasn't even it wasn't even about it wasn't even about agreeing with everything she said. It was just the idea of let's stop thinking that their idea, their their perspective is normal. You know what I'm saying? Their perspective is is the basis and everything is a variant off of them. You know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, that's real. That's real. You know what I'm saying? We aren't variants of them. They're a whole different thing. You know what I'm saying? They're human. We you know we we relate. I have I I, I completely understand race as a as a social construct. Um, but hundreds of years of racial differences and then racial interactions has caught has caused some psychological and emotional differences that we've only analyzed through their eyes. You know what I'm saying? And this book was like, nah, let's let's look at it like like they're the weirdos. <laughs> wow. And I, I appreciated that. I okay. appreciated that. Um, are you gonna tell us the an event or or Million Man March? Million Man March. Wow. Yeah. Million Man March. It was very important for me. Enough said, enough said on that, right? It, it be, we know why. We know yeah. why. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I was just thinking to myself the other day, um, teenage me would be proud of the 40 year old me that I am now. You know <laughs> the one who like went that. to the Million Man March would be very proud of the version of I am now. So that's pretty cool. Yes, that is pretty cool. Um, what are you most afraid of? Um honestly passing before my children are able to take care of themselves mm, that's, every, that's, that's every, my, every parent's fear right biggest fear biggest fear and he, not, everything else i can handle i think even i was thinking earlier like um that would be in the moment that i know that i'm dying that would be the thing if i in the moment that i know i'm dying and if my daughter's still five that's would be the thing that would mm. piss me that would be the part that you know what i'm saying yeah, that yeah. would be the part that like hurt you know um I mean, shoot, I want to be here when she's 70, but, you know, right. I want to at least, I at least want to get through the part where she's five. So, yes. yeah, that's, yes. that's my, you favorite. know, it can happen, you know, speaking, you know, words, words have power. I mean, my, yeah. my sister uh, spoke about her, um, one of her, she, she works in a, in a home and the lady is, she was celebrating her hundredth birthday in her mm -hmm. full right mind. And her daughter was celebrating her 50th birthday. That's, that's Wow. That's she's like, I, she wanted to be a mother. She was pregnant when she was 49. She's Jeez. 100. 
that's what's up. It can happen. Get you it. Know? Yeah. It can happen. And she's in her that's full love. right mind too, right? And you that's, full right mind. And that's the second. And that's the second thing that I'm a scared. I'm a, I said a scared, afraid a of. Scared. You are a scared. You are scared about full full right mind. So mm -hmm. like my whole business is around me being able to use my brain and use my words. Right. Alzheimer's wreck havoc on my grandparents' generation. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I've got friends and colleagues who are working on that as a problem. They're PhDs and, and MDs and stuff like that. Um, that's the only thing that scares me because I don't plan on retiring. Um, but I do, I do want to stay in my right mind. And I realize that that's not guaranteed. And so I've already told my family, like, you know, if I start losing it in my old age, just sit me in front of a bunch of kids and lie to me and tell me they're my grandkids and I'll be fine. And you'll you know be what fine. I'm saying? And yeah. I'll be and I'll be fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you make music. Mm -hmm. What type of music do you listen to? Uh a lot of jazz. Um, right now, a lot of Latin music. I've been trying to go through all of Mongo Santa Maria's music. My music changes up all the time. Um, um, but I would say I listen to a lot of jazz, a lot of Latin music. Um, a lot of old nineties go-go, um, and like eighties and seventies gospel. Um, Ooh. I tell people, I tell people I'm into gospel music and that's, that's misleading. I'm into gospel music when I was a kid mm -hmm. and the gospel totally music. Different. Yeah. So the gospel music from when I was a kid was the music from a generation before. So I'm into like 70s, 80s gospel. I'm realizing that's a better way to describe it. I like modern gospel. I was, I'm sitting on my piano the other day, just going through people's Instagrams, learning how to do a bump. You know what I'm saying? Learn how to do shout music because I, I love the vibe and I'm, I'm always trying to figure out how to get people hype. You know, that's how that my introduction to music is gospel and go-go. Um, and so, um, yeah, yeah. But, but on a regular basis, and this is also, and then the last thing I listen to is my music. There it is. Um, I, I used to be modest about it, but then I had to think about it. It's like the reason I wrote the song is because I wish this song existed. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, right, right. So let me listen to. So it. now that it exists, let me go listen to it because this right. is the whole. This is the song I wish was out there, and it's not I like Eric. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's like it's that's why I wrote the song. So yeah, I listen to my music a lot. Yes. Yeah. So shout out. Anybody or organization is somebody who who treated you magnificent when they booked you to come out somewhere. Treated me, you, me. <laughs> Bus Boys and Poets. Yeah. Bus Boys and Poets is one of the best and most consistent paying gigs, and you bringing me to Bus Boys and Poets is great. Um, the Public Playhouse. I I pointed to it because it's not too far from where I live. Um. <laughs> The public playhouse where I just did my last kids show and where I'm going to do my next one on February 5th is a good segue. On February 5th, I'm doing the Frederick Douglass Writing Club. It's an interactive um, writing uh, 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 performance, a hip hop performance that's for all the young writers. Um, I, I realized, you know, that I stumbled into a one man show about Frederick Douglass. Like, that's what I do now. Um, and and public playhouse is giving me their stage and their lighting and video projection and um, I got a whole set and I got lines and I got timings and marks and you know what I'm saying like I have a wow. one man show now. Um, I'm coming. When is this? February fifth. This February fifth. And so okay. so so one of the things I that know. I do. Yes, yes. Please do. Please come. Um, and I think that February fifth show is going to be the um, like if I had a Netflix special, this is what that right now in 2000. 22 that that what, what's going to happen on february 5th is what, what my netflix special will be um and it's been like a decade in the making and um yeah that's i'm, I'm and so the public playhouse treats me really well the kennedy center treats me really well um i'm still like um i i've had so many peaks and valleys and i've and i've um and i did open mics for so long that i think i appreciate <laughs> the little things and so now that i'm performing at theaters like on a consistent basis mm -hmm. i'm like oh no i like i'm supposed to just get like food meal service and everything so like <laughs> like that's what i'm supposed to have I, well, I, still, I, I, I hear you i still show up to my gigs with all my own sound even if i don't need it 
You know what I'm you saying? Still do? So I, st- I, you, I gotta really trust and know and believe that your sound is on point. Because even if you tell me you have sound, I'm bringing mine just in case. You know what I'm saying? My, my, I, this is the joke that I made, and I think it was God backfiring on me. I went and bought a whole bunch of sound and lighting equipment, and I said the only thing that's stopping my live show is an act of God. And then a month later, COVID hit. You know what wow. I'm saying? Wow. So, <laughs> but I have all that equipment sitting, you know what I'm saying, ready to go wherever, wherever, you know, Baba Bomani or the Watermelon Man is needed. So, yeah. Who taught you how to play instruments? Um, Sister Bird. Uh, specifically, that's her name, Sister Bird, because she's from a church. Um, Miss Schiller, my old piano teacher. And um, I learned the drums from my church not having a drummer and me having rhythm. That's how I learned how to play the drums. And then my secondary piano teacher is like about 100 to 200 different people on YouTube right now. Um, I consider myself a studio musician. All the, Almost all the music you hear is me playing the instruments. There, I hire musicians right. on some of the songs, most of all of it. And I sound really good in the studio. I am not a live performer, but one of the <laughs> things... But on February 5th, I'm actually, I do a live podcast every morning. And one of the things I do on my morning podcast is I play the Black National Anthem every morning for my entire audience, whoever's watching. And sometimes it's only three people, whatever. But I plan on, my plan in 2023 moving forward is to be more of a live piano player. So I've been practicing. So, yeah. Word, word. Yeah. Come here, baby. She's just over here having her whole little thing. Just having her thing. Okay, all right, okay. So, um, I think I feel like I was going to ask you another question. Oh, let me ask this now. How can people support you uh, monetarily and otherwise? Got you. So, um, I appreciate that question. Um, The best way that people can support me is to uh, hire me, get my merchandise, or donate. And you can do that at notarapper.com. Um, if you go to notarapper.com, it can take you to my other websites. My my website for the kids is Baba Gat Bars. There's a whole bunch of stuff about me that I do for the kids that you can find on Not A Rapper. But I, because of the conversation we were having earlier, I wanted a website that kids could go to that doesn't have any of my political other That's stuff smart. on it, right? That's smart. Yeah. So Baba Gat Bars is where you can find that. But honestly, the biggest thing is making sure, like, and I think this is the thing, and, and I, you probably understand this too. Um, the people in the independent art scene who like what I do, telling other people by sharing and telling people that you like me, you know what I'm saying? Is like the right. biggest, is the biggest right. help. Um, um, people are think, oh, I really like this. I hope word gets out. The way word gets out is by you spreading the word. You know what I'm saying? And I don't, I'm not asking people, like, I don't think, um, I don't, I don't base my friendship on people with people on whether or not they share my artwork. But when my friends say, how can I help? And that's not the first thing they've done. And I'm like, hey, come on. Like, that's that's the beginning. Like, let people right. know. Right. Know? So, okay. so well, but yeah, rapper. not a com. That'll do it. Not a rapper.com. And, and, and the bottom of your screen is Baba oh, oh, you asked me about not a rapper too, right? I have a website now called bomaniarma.com. But my thoughts 20 years ago was not a rapper is easier to remember. And you were not going to miss fail. Them. Then <laughs> Bomani, because you got to figure out, you got to remember Bomani Arma. Right, so right. I, so not a rapper seemed to, uh, yeah. You should, you should, you should scrap the not a rapper dot com. Just have it as as the basis, and then when you go to it, it's gonna say it click here for Bomani. Bomani yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I can make <laughs> it automatically yeah. switch when you go. Yeah, yeah. Automatically switch to Bomani yep. Arma. That's, yep. that's, that, that, that's that's the next move. That's to, the, that's, that's the twenty twenty three move. So I am going to ask you to give us another piece. I'm gonna bring back my um co um what are, what are they today co people co people and if we have any questions in uh facebook or uh youtube you can type them in the chat so i'm gonna exit myself and leave the screen to you cool so um since we talked a lot about my teaching artistry i'm gonna do this rhyme about being a teaching artist uh uh the track is called ababa mulimu wawatoto which is in broken english and swahili means my i father teach the children you can find it at notarapper.com the beat is actually produced by my children olu and dela um 
yeah, let's do it. Uh, I Baba Mulim. Uh, I'm about to forget the whole opening line. Let me calm down and slow down. Hold on. Bump, 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 bump. Um, 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 um. Uh, first things first, I Baba Mulimu Wawa Toto for show with my pro flow since the days of madness and hobo. I spots and ties my hall for gogos, waiting for the conga solo. Drums make heart race like the logos on your polo. Where chocolate city turns to hot cocoa, keep it bouncing like a pogo. Some things you gotta do when you're local, like eat fries with mambo or Joe and Tony Romo. I rep DC the PG uptown, the upper Marlboro. No part of DC or MD, I won't go. No part of my beautiful blackness that I won't show. I'm TNN between Nor. Ray and Chris Cuomo capture a thousand thoughts of one photo. Kindergarten is time lapse, prison time happens slow mo. I've taught both, so I got theories. Here they go. These little bros with no dough, a press to bring the bag in like Frodo, or walk quick roads with their dogs like Toto. They listen to trap rap like it's a job promo. Life on edge, the slightest thing can put them into go mode. They just want a home though. Women express love, no need to say no homo. So I rewrite the bro code. Rap kids and culture like Basotos from Lesotho. Here a reference that you don't know was Google on your phone foe been teaching kids since 94 as a high school sophomore mo. a bit long ago back when a mo was a joe boys and girls club with daryl and carlos can't you see like that single from toad Dole? if you paint a picture for students that's hopeful marinate students in love like it's a dobo you can show bros with bow nose and girls to be flow joe so i put their message to a dope flow i'll say it again though you've heard it all before in the wrong environment the seed won't grow ask a fish to climb a tree your talents won't show it give a musician their instrument boom virtuoso uh, this ain't a theory that I'm speaking. I know so. I learned from an optimist with a capital O to kids from Bell, Dunbar, Ellington, and Cardozo. An after school program, hip hop dojo. New age griot, our integration mogul. Proving it with metrics or even an adodal. Now the hip hop Dr. Seuss, all the places we will go. Frederick Hart for Baltimore, Anna Ronald Moco. St. Mary's Charles with Chester, we're comical. Coming to America like Eddie and Arsenio to tell your kid their mind's dripping. So let your soul glow. Our foes chase no does with four logos. Use the wake of moments to put our kids in chokeholds. My mind's my nine, my pins, my Mac 10 vocals kicking the dough. way been the faux foe. All you heard is Baba Mulimu Wawa Toto. Look it up if you don't know. First things first, I Baba Mulimu Wawa Toto. Baba got bars. Thank y'all very much. Thank y'all for supporting me. Go to notarapper.com. Go to babagatbars.com. Thank you very much for having me on your program. I appreciate the love, y'all. No, no, we said first we thank you for coming because you are. Oh, thank you. Let me do my b-boy stands. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. Um, I know we spoke about how uh read a book ended up on BET and the CNN situation. Uh -huh. Really, what was, my question is, what was your inspiration into writing and composing that? Um, I'm trying to get in the kids' heads. Okay. I, I'm trying to affect people's thoughts and I know rhythm and rhyme does that. And so me and my best friend, once again, Everett, his, his father's the Dean of the Chapel at uh, Howard University. And, um, we sat around in the basement just trying to figure out like, yo, crunk is like running the world. Like how can we figure out how to use crunk, you know, to our advantage. And I was like, it, it seems like the key to crunk is to just yell and scream instructions. Right. And, and Everett's brother was like, and make sure you don't rhyme, like resist the urge to rhyme. And so he was like, yeah. So if all you got to do is yell instructions, why can't it be something righteous? And so we just joked around was like, you know, raise your kids you know what I'm saying? Wash your hands. You know what I'm saying? Blah, blah, blah. And then read a book. I was like, yeah, we should do something. Read a book. And we still weren't taking it seriously. And I don't know why. I guess it's just because how my brain works. At one point, I went R-E-A-D-A-B-O-O-K. Right. And I was mm -hmm. like, oh, this is a thing now. You know what I'm saying? At first, it was just a joke. And it was like, no, that actually can crank. And then I was like, I, where do I get the beat? And um. Beethoven goes hard and and it's you know there's no copyright law on Beethoven so I just you <laughs> I use me everybody was like yo how'd you get that sample I was like no Beethoven predates like yeah I just the yeah, he's, he's public domain that's dope. that's dope and all that classical stuff cranks honestly mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying so yeah um and so uh yeah so then I made it and then I put it this tell you how long ago it was I put it on MySpace. 
Oh. And that's when the montage. And this up on money? What is my space? (laughs) (laughs) This is a social media site at the turn of the millennium. <laughs> Don't you love how that makes everything seem older than it is? And it it really really where really we are right now? Wow. So, do you know how BET picked it up? Uh, people passed it around until it got on um, Reggie Hudlin's desk. Okay. Reggie Hudlin directed um, Boomerang and a whole bunch of other movies. And wow. I didn't, I didn't know, I've known his work, but I didn't know who he was. And so when I told my friends, like, yeah, BET called me, they want to, uh, cause they, they, BET started an animation department and it only lasted two videos cause they hired me and NY oil. And the first two videos, the, the animation department made, made fun of BET's rap music videos, which is their bread and butter. So it was like a comic, uh, it was like a kamikaze mission, like off break. You know what I'm saying? Dennis Cowan, the guy who created, um, is it Black Lightning? It's one of the comic book characters. It's the black kid who, who conducts lightning, right? And so yeah. they hired him. He directed the video. Um, uh, I don't know if you have kids around TV age, but if you've ever seen the show Wow Wow Wubsy, um, mm-hmm. it's a cartoon for like like four-year-olds. Kanika yeah. is about to get into it in a little while. It's old school now, but it's a show called Wow Wow Wubsy. If you have kids who've seen Wow Wow Wubsy and then you saw read a book, you'd be like, oh, they look oddly similar. It's because <laughs> it's the same producers. And um, yeah, yeah. Um, when when BET called me, I told my friends, I was like, yeah, Reggie Hudlin or somebody. And they're like, Reggie Hudlin, oh my God, he's huge. He did all your favorite Eddie Murphy, blah, 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 blah. And um, yeah, I, I'll tell you the truth. Um, Read a book was a blessing. I was going. I used to say, "There's no curse." It was all blessing, but the biggest blessing is it overhyped me, thinking that I was, I was good, that I could be in the music business. Mm-hmm. At the time, I was at a pivot point where I probably, if I had quit, it would have made sense, right? Read a book was like, "Oh no, I could do this," and so I stayed in longer. And even after read a book. I think I had struggles that were like, maybe I should quit now, but read a book was such a huge moment that it was like, nah, you know what I'm saying? Like I needed that spark. And then I think my, my from the other big spark was Melo D giving me a spot on his song. Cool with you. You know what I'm saying? It just made me think that I could do it. Um, and the artist who did read a book is no, is not nearly as good as the artist that I am now, but I needed read a book to happen. So I, I would think so that the, you know, the world would see me and I'd be like, I can do this. I can do this. You know what I'm saying? I just need to spend my time and my energy and concentrate on it. And it's been a blessing. Um, I know uh, I'm, I, I realize now uh, my, my, my boy helped me realize this, that um, one of the conflicts I was going through at the time um, that I wasn't able to articulate until I saw Dave Chappelle talking about it was realizing that people were laughing for the wrong reasons some places and dealing with that you know what i'm saying was also like i am so glad that i turned down the opportunity because all the record labels called me mm-hmm. but all of them wanted read a book part two three four and five and i didn't mind poking fun at black culture when at the moment where like it was honest it was true and i was like oh this is funny this is relevant but i didn't want to make a career of me coming down to my basement figuring out oh how do i make fun of black culture today you know what i'm saying like if it happens it happens but that 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 could have been my entry and i think part of you know what paused and slowed down my career and then turned it into what it is is like i don't want to be like just read a book part two, three, four, and five. Like, I love the fact that I did read a book and I'll do read a book part two when the moment hits. Um, but I don't want to just sit there and just try to, you know what I'm saying? Make fun of culture rather than make culture. And I think what I do for the kids is make culture. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm really, I'm really proud of that. Well, if I have to say one thing, we always say, um, we have been told and we always mention it in our intro that this has been dubbed a masterclass of artistry and um, making it as an artist. And if there's one thing that I just pulled from what you said is just if you produce a quality product, 
everything else will come behind it. Because in the early 2000s, at the turn of the century, um, Millennium. <laughs> huh? at the turn Millennium. of the <laughs> going viral wasn't a thing. You know, everybody had a MySpace, just like everybody has a Facebook, a YouTube. Most yep. everybody has a TikTok or an Instagram. And it's about finding a good product is what I want to say. Yeah, no, no, definitely, definitely. And then, and then, and, um, and I, I do believe, and I'm, I'm glad Kaniki brought up U Street. I do believe like not living for the viral was good mm -hmm. for me. You know what I'm saying? Like I had art in real life and I do poetry in real life and I've been trying, you know, I want to go viral again. But like I, I also, I see a thousand different people every week. You know what I'm saying? And U Street made me realize how important it is to make sure I keep that that real face to face interaction with people. And that's how you learn what works and what doesn't, and what people need and what kind of rhymes they need in their life. Static shock. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. I, I, I have learned so much. It was such. It was such a meaty. You got a lot. I was oh, like, my you. brain is about to explode, but it was good stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, this is probably going to sound stupid, but one of the things I took away was, so you mean to tell me that every fruit has a national <laughs> board? <laughs> <laughs> they all have a trade organization. They do. Mm -hmm. And they all probably have a day. They all have a day. The National Watermelon Day is technically August 3rd. But that falls any day of the week. So I make Watermelon Day the first Saturday of August. Okay. Um, so that's the Sankofa Black People Watermelon Day, the first gotcha. Saturday in August. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody yeah. had, every organization has their version of NWA. Yeah. <laughs> every fruit. Oh my gosh. No, seriously. I mean, it was one of my takeaways, but definitely it was a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, content and, and thought provoking things for me to even think about as an artist. And I think one of the things I personally love what I'm hearing and what I've heard was the authenticity of your artwork, like of your of your uh, path in, as an artist. You have seemed to be very intentional about maintaining your authenticity to what you do and why you do it. Like you said, I, never chasing the viral, never caring about do they like it? This is what feeds my soul, my heart. And that's a takeaway for me as an artist. And I'm hoping uh, maybe even for the audience to 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 remain as authentic to yourself and to your artistry. So that was that was a wonderful takeaway for me. I do have a question. My particular um, segment is called Passion Projects, and one of the things that I ask or try to converse with the artists about is uh, the their passion, both the high end enthusiasm passion and the angst, the pull and the tug of your passion. And, you know, listening to um, you reminisce and reflect and share, I felt like, wow, this has just been a wonderful path, right? Of just falling into place. But, you know, what would you say, if anything, would is a part of that pull and tug, that angst that comes along with doing or, or fulfilling your passion? Um, You know, I think, I'm doing the whole human thing of trying to figure out the purpose of life. Yeah. And I think I've, I've figured out some parts, at least that I think that I've, I've began to hold on to. Um, one of the things is like a new motto for me. Um, the three things that I want to do is um, honor the ancestors, um, is honor the ancestors, prepare the descendants and love right now. Mm. Um, those are the, th those are the three things that I want to do all. And those are the three things that make me feel that I think like, there's a billion things within those, but if those are the three things that I'm always doing, then I'm building something towards like my children enjoying their lives and my community enjoying their lives. And I think, I think that's, and so everything is trying to follow in those lines. You know what I'm saying? All wow. of the, all of everything that I'm teaching is me reading what my ancestors did and what I appreciate and what I learned that they did that I shouldn't do. And me trying to tell young people about that. And in a practical way, in a way that they can use it, but then not have them so worried about the future that they can't just enjoy right now and listening to a beat and eating a slice of watermelon and enjoying each other's smiles. So all of those happening at the same time is kind of I'm trying to make all those happen at once. And that's 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 I think that's all that's the tie line between all my projects, the passion yeah. between them all. 
Ooh, that's beautiful. Wow. I, I, that needs to be. Uh, <laughs> right now it's the motto for my morning show. Okay. Got it, got it. I was like, it's Y'all are more than welcome to visit. What, 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 what are we doing this morning show situation? <laughs> so it's just, it's called the morning announcements. And I do it every morning, Monday through Thursday at 6.30 a.m. And okay. it never lasts more than 15 minutes. Okay. The very, you know, very, a whole bunch of dads wake up with me before they go to work and actually watch it then. But there's, so there's, I, I do uh, the, the, I play the black national anthem every morning and my audience is watching me get better at playing it on piano. Mm -hmm. Um, I do something called a libation where I pick an ancestor and I give you a really brief bio and then I tell you a quote that they said and then I give my response to that quote, like what I think that quote means to us today now. I've been doing this for like three months. I've been doing it since the last Watermelon Day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I will intro a children's book or a community space or an artist or a teaching artist who's good for the community. So the whole idea is that you wake up, you get a whole bunch of red, black, and green energy, and I give you some information that, you know, either makes you feel better or is like, oh, I'm going to go read that book with my kids tonight. You know what I'm saying? That type of thing. And it never lasts more than 15 minutes. And um, I got other um, podcasts and blog ideas coming. And whenever those happen, I'm probably going to do those um, – that you probably have to pay for them to see them live on Patreon, but I'll use clips mm -hmm. of them in my morning announcements. I'm going to yeah. do interviews with teaching artists, interview with my favorite artists, and I'm going to ask them to say something inspiring, and I'm going to use it in the morning show all the time. So, Got it. That, and where do we watch? Um, right now, if you go to Not A Rapper or BomaniArmad.com, um, if you go to my Facebook or my YouTube, go to Not A Rapper, and it will take you there now. But Monday through Thursday, mm -hmm. Monday through Thursday, 6 30 a.m. is when you can see it live and if you follow me on social media um the segments where i talk about the ancestor of the day and i talk about the book for the night mm -hmm. and um I'm, I'm starting a new thing this week where um every um every country from the african diaspora when their independence day comes up i do a feature on them so tomorrow i'm doing zambia um Ooh, nice it's a, um so but just something you know extra rbg and let's get up and take over the world. That's what I'm trying to do every morning. So, and it, it's it's for my audience, but it's honestly just so I start a ritual that I keep that keep helps me keep my own sanity together. So, you know. so for the parents that are listening to this now, because you said you intro a book, if that is the book that you intro easily accessible, something they could get their hands on. Usually, yes, but okay. I also, well, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I'm trying to get better with my connections. So, um, my my wife works for the Center for African Studies at Howard University and the uh, the Africana Studies Book Awards. So mm -hmm. we get a different book every day from some. So the idea is for us to find books. Uh, she finds books about Africa, and mm -hmm. then gets them in the hands of teachers who are trying to teach about Africa. So I have a wall full of books about Africa that a lot of people have never even seen. And so as I'm going through them, sometimes I, I have to choose um, whether or not I use this book whether on based on how easily it's distributed. You know what I'm saying? Because some of them are literally from the Congo and from, and we're still part of the thing that we're working on is making it even easier for them to distribute those books. Um, but most of them you can find, I don't want to send you to the people everyone gets books from that is taking over the world and sending penises into space. Um, but you can get them from Sankofa video and books. Um, you can get them from Mahogany books. And I always post the, 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 the author's direct website. So there might okay. be a publisher that you can buy it from that, you know what I'm saying? would be best for the, for the, author. Oh, cause, cause that's what I, cause that's what I want to hear is that like, if I hear something interesting, I want to be able to put my hands on it. I, I was doing a book every day, mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to, and I read all types of books to my children. So it's not even about what types of book I read to my children, but for the show being an RBG, RBG themed show, I needed mm -hmm. either the character or the author to be of African descent. And so I've slowed down from doing one every day to one every week to make sure that I can really get into them and, and make sure I'm, I'm vetting the books that I really like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So oh, thank like, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming through. And of course, um, analysis, our secret male member, um, as we call him, and our local bookseller. <laughs> more. Um, yes, support independent bookstores at all costs if you can, because because yeah. th that's where you're going to find the most amazing things. I got introduced to Black consciousness at Karibu Books. 
um, a, a series of bookstores that used to exist here in the, the the DMV. I used to work at a couple of different locations. I'm still really good friends with both of the owners. Um, mm -hmm. But like that was my uh, I was trying to work at a bookstore. Um, Sankofa wouldn't hire me. And I don't know if you remember. I can't remember. the was it Pyramid Books? They 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 yeah I don't even know if they're there anymore but they were willing to hire me but um but they but PG Plaza was closer to where I was living so <laughs> so but being introduced you know to black consciousness through books and independent black booksellers is definitely a part of my story like a huge part of my story cool so if anyone does not have a question for the group. I will ask the last question. Girl Genius would normally do this, but she had to uh, take care of something. So our last question is always, as she says, the toughest one of the night. Now that you've been on a show and you've had an experience and you've talked to all of us, you have an idea of all four segments. Uh -huh. You have to remind them. The segments are uh, Danielle, uh, Girl Genius does, let's talk about the, it could be book or any type of project. Uh -huh. Miss Cayenne is Passion Projects. My night is called From Behind the Microphone. And of course, right now you are on Poets and Platforms. Our question, who would you like to see us interview? Would make a good guest here on the platform. Um, my, my rap nephew, Malachi Bird. Uh, Ooh. Just so, just so that thirty years from now, y'all can be like, "Yeah, we interviewed him when," because that's what's gonna happen. I would love to interview him. Yeah, I, I know, like I know some, I know some, I know some people who are even a little bit more established than him. But I think, like, mm -hmm. I think, I think the world of him. So I think, yeah, y'all would get a really cool interview out of him. That is perfect. I appreciate that answer, and we will add it. <laughs> the first thing cool. I want to do is, um, every as we do at this moment, I want everyone in the room to please give a huge round of applause. Oh, well, thank you to thank our you. guest, Bomani. Thank you. Thank I'm gonna have to give a snap since I got the baby in the other arm. Right, I see it. Not, look, that's not supposed to be on any social media, but she was in the background screaming. So, and if you would like to an opportunity to see Bomani live and in person December 12th at Bus Boys and Poets, 450 K Street, hosted by me. Yeah. Come on out. Come on out. I will let everyone know that we will be back next Sunday with one of our with one of our amazing fifth week events. Those are our quarterly round table where, where all four of us get the chance to interview one artist. Yay. And when we booked the guests next week for next week the excitement amongst the crew probably was felt all through the dmv baltimore up and down 995. our guest for our quarterly round table next week is the fifth l femi the dry fish and uh and native son why did his name Ooh. his name just ran out my head ran out ross right Yes, David Nathan's son Ross. So I'm about to say David. Ooh. Yes, tell, when I tell y'all, I started to say it, and then it completely just went out of my head. So we are really excited about this interview next Sunday. So be back here 7 p.m. on the dot. Ask Ask Femi about being a teaching artist because he works for the same organization I do. Mm. I like yeah like I re I really want to put everybody on to that like if you want to be an artist like and you like kids you know yeah and not I, if you like not like but if you're willing to work with and, and willing to learn more about how to work with them yeah yeah. yeah yeah oh yes so everyone please stay safe wash your hands hug your loved ones a little bit tighter let them know you love them and we will see y'all all next week Bye. Thank no thank you